Hello everyone, this is going to be 3.3, Powerful Empires Emerge in India. So we are going to start by looking at our objectives here. We are going to analyze how the Mauryan, that's a certain sort of kingdom or, or dynasty, uh, how Mauryan rulers uh, created a strong central government for their empire. We're going to explore the kingdoms that arose across the Deccan Plateau. We're going to explain why the period of Gupta rule in India is considered its golden age and kind of talk about what a golden age actually means, too. And lastly, we're going to understand how family and village life shaped Indian society. So let's start with the Mauryan Empire, building a very strong government, but in different ways. So the Ganges Valley in northern India was in very high demand geographically uh, and politically uh, because of its water. And so this led to many princes fighting over the territory because they wanted it uh, to create a fertile kingdom. Uh, and then in 321 before the Common Era, uh, a, a Mauryan, this is the first of the Mauryan Empire, a guy named Chandragupta Maurya, conquered the area and formed the first Indian Empire. This is um, not talking about the ancient Indus River Valley people. Now, most of what we know about the Mauryans come actually from Greeks who uh, visited. The ancient Greek ambassador Megasthenes was... Uh, he wrote about the uh, Marian Empire. Uh, he wrote about the Marian capital, a place called Pataliputra. And so the Marian capital had things like schools, libraries, temples, and even palaces during this time. So they, they had a lot of stuff there. They, this was not a small empire, nor was it uh, cheap. So here is the height of the Marian Empire. Everything in brown is Marian at that point. So they conquered a good chunk of India and most of uh, what is modern-day Pakistan as well. And here are the ruins of Pataliputra up in northeast India. Now, Chandragupta started his reign in the Ganges Valley before expanding across all of northern India, as we saw. The tip of southern India remained in other hands. Now, his children and his grandchildren continued to push further south into the Deccan Plateau, uh, and the Mauryans ruled from about 321 to 185 before the Common Era. Uh, they had uh, a strong bureaucracy, meaning that they were very well organized. Uh, they built roads and harbors. They were good with trade. They built courts for justice, and they collected taxes in order to pay for all this. Now, here is a statue of young Chandragupta Maurya at India's parliament building, in their capital. Now, that is a very nice little picture of Chandragupta Maurya, looking very calm and peaceful and stoic. He was actually known to be quite a brutal ruler. Uh, if you went up against him, or you uh, committed a crime, or if you disagreed with him, really, in any way, if you opposed his government or dissented, you could be met with extreme punishment, bad punishment, death, even. And Chandragupta Maurya used a secret police force in order to keep the people in order. Uh, he even created an all-female guard for himself and secret passages so he could move around his palace unseen. Now, that is Chandragupta. However, it is his grandson Ashoka who is considered the greatest of the Mauryan Empire. Um, Mauri, uh, Ch or, I'm sorry, Ashoka began his rule of the Mauryan Empire in 268 BCE. And soon after becoming the emperor, he actually converted to Buddhism. Now, this did not mean he became a pacifist, at least not right away. Uh, he uh, started to conquer other areas. He conquered the kingdom of Kalinga in the Deccan Plateau. However, after a long and brutal battle against them, he decided that um, he'd had enough warfare and bloodshed. And so he rejected violence in accordance with his more pacifist Buddhist beliefs, and became a very wise and very uh, peaceful ruler of the Mauryan Empire. So here is Ashoka standing in his chariot. Now Ashoka tried to be an example of how to be a good Buddhist and a good ruler at the same time. Uh, he gave up eating meat, he ended animal sacrifices, he sent missionaries, religious people, uh, to spread the word of Buddha uh, throughout India. He also tolerated other religions as well, so he was willing to sort of deal with other religions. Uh, Ashoka also tried to spread Buddhism uh, throughout India by 
virtue of the written word. So he created these large stone pillars uh, with laws on them uh, and promises of just government on them. And he also did things like he built hospitals and roads and places where travelers could stop and rest and, and you know get a drink of water, get some fruit and things like that. So here are some of the uh, monuments that Ashoka made during his time. Uh, you will see this is one of the few that is uh, remaining. This is one of the pillars of Ashoka, and it actually has writing on it as well, saying, you know, I built this and for these reasons to, you know, make life better for everybody. Uh, one of the things he had put on there was, I have banyan trees planted on the roads to give shade to people and animals. I have planted mango groves, and I have had wells dug and shelters erected along the roads. So he was a pacifist, but that doesn't mean that he didn't believe in some good PR for himself, apparently. Now, Mauryan power grew under Ashoka. However, after his death, and this is something we've seen before and we'll see again, um, he Later rulers could not hold it together as well as Ashoka did, and so rival princes started to fight each other for control of the region. Um, now, India has a long history of both being very uh, united in certain ways, such as cultural, uh, cultural bonds, you know, uh, religious bonds. However, uh, locally and regionally, there's also a lot of disharmony just based on, you know, different people have different belief systems. Um, along with all this sort of inner warfare, uh, where we see that people are fighting each other internally, we also see that people are coming around through the Khyber Pass and attacking India directly. Uh, some of these uh, attackers would just attack and then flee and leave. Others uh, stuck around and later on became new rulers, as a matter of fact. Now let's look at some of the Deccan kingdoms. Uh, the Deccan Plateau, if you recall, is in the middle of India. In the, south, in the southern Deccan region, there were many kingdoms, and uh, they had their own capitals with temples and palaces, and, you know, each of them was quite powerful as well. And these southern kingdoms had a bit of a different culture, uh, including occasionally women who rose to power. <clears throat> they had queens in this area, something we don't often see in other empires in India. So, um, they had Hinduism, they had Buddhism, and they had the written Sanskrit language. Uh, they all eventually made their way into this Deccan region, and uh, they were accepted by the rulers who lived there. Now, in southern India, there were Tamil kingdoms. So uh, if you look back at the map that we looked at earlier on, you'll notice that the southern tip of India was unconquered, and that's because that's where the Tamil kingdoms lived, and they were quite powerful. They were trading nations, trading kingdoms. Uh, they created harbors for ships, uh, they traveled overseas, and these Tamil kingdoms also uh, traded internally with each other um, and with China and Southeast Asia. And we have found evidence of the Tamil kingdoms sending their spices and textiles <clears throat> all the way west into Rome. Now, the authors of Tamil kingdoms, they had, they had Sanskrit, so we can translate their language and their writings, uh, they wrote about fierce wars. They wrote about big heroes. Uh, however, they also did leave us some idea of just the everyday life of people living in these Tamil kingdoms as well. So here are the trade routes that the Tamils uses. You'll, you'll see that they go all the way from India into Arabia into Italy. Uh, so they made their way all the way over to Italy and down the east coast of Africa. So that is the Mauryan empires. We looked at the Gupt, uh, I'm sorry, at the, uh, the, the Tamil kingdoms. And lastly, we are going to look at the Gupta rulers. And this is considered the golden age for uh, India. The most powerful kingdoms were still up in the north during this time. And after the fall of the Mauryan empire, a new group came in called the Guptas. Now these are, don't get confused. Chandra Gupta Maurya is one guy. The Guptas are a completely different group, um, but the Guptas ruled and united most of India uh, from about 320 to about 540 in the Common Era. Now, historians often refer to this as India's Golden Age, a time where they were uh, seeing great cultural and um, you know artistic achievement oftentimes, uh, maybe economic achievement as well. This is what usually is associated with a Golden Age. 
So the Guptas in this time period were not as, as strict um, as the, uh, the Mauryans were, and they promoted peace and prosperity. Um, they were not big on punishments, and most of the power was held at the local level and not by the king. Now, there were still lots of, there was lots of trade and farming going on, especially uh, people growing wheat and rice and sugarcane and making cloth and pottery and metals. And uh, just like we saw with the Tamil kingdoms, they traded all over the place. Their goods made it all the way to Africa in the Middle East. It's amazing that archaeology can prove to us that certain goods made it that far. Now, along with all of this prosperity came opportunities for learning and education and culture and writing as well. So one of the things that we see is the rise of religious schools, educating young men, usually men. Uh, they taught religion, but they also did math, science, uh, languages, medicine, all sorts of things. Now, Indian mathematicians also created a very simple number system uh, Today we call it Arabic numerals, which is what you use when you go into math class, or Arabic numerals. Um, we call them Arabic because the people in the Arabian Peninsula borrowed them from India, so they're actually kind of misnamed. Arabic numerals actually come from India, and they spread from India to the Middle East uh, and eventually into Europe as well. Now, Indian mathematicians also developed the idea of a number called zero, which is sort of the lack of a number. Um, they also helped create the decimal system, a unit of measurement based around the number 10, something that we still see used today, uh, especially with things like the Dewey Decimal System in libraries, uh, the metric system in most of uh, the civilized world, except for, you know, America and other places. So these are the Indian and Arabic number systems, uh, which you eventually see evolve into our own number system today. This, by the way, is the decimal system. So next time you're in math class and you're having trouble and you, you accidentally divide by zero or something like that, you can thank the Indian subcontinent for your pain and troubles. But also say thank you because otherwise you'd, you'd be a lot less intelligent without them. So, along with these mathematicians, they also did things like study astronomy. They studied the stars and the planets and the heavens. Um, this knowledge eventually traveled to the Middle East, prompting Arab mathematical uh, achievements as well. So, uh, all of these eventually made it to Europe. So, the Indians not, did not just trade their goods, but traded their ideas as well. This is a big uh, idea that we've seen throughout all of the semester so far. Now, there is also evidence that doctors in India by the time of the Gupta Empire could heal people with herbs and uh, they could do things like set bones and do minor surgeries. We have some evidence of this. It's believed that they actually worked with vaccinations as well. Um, they uh, would sort of draw a sharp needle uh, through somebody's skin who had a, uh, an illness and then they would draw that same needle through the uh, skin of a healthy person to sort of give them a low-impact version of whatever disease it was. Uh, and this is about a thousand years before they started doing this in Europe right there. So here is uh, Shushruta, who is the father of surgery in India. Again, I don't know why they like poking people in the eyes so much back then. Ouch. Uh, now, during the Gupta Empire, authors also started to write down a lot of the folk tales and the things that we uh, still have today. For instance, we've already talked about the Bhagavad Gita, we've talked about the Ramayana. Um, these were written down during this time into Sanskrit, which we have the ability to read. Uh, and these writings also traveled throughout the world. Um, probably the best known of the Gupta authors was Kalidasa, who wrote a play actually, who wrote a piece of theater called Shakuntala, which was a love story about a king who marries a beautiful young orphan girl and then loses her and eventually is able to gain her back. Uh, the classic love story, boy meets girl, boy falls in love with girl, uh, girl leaves, boy brings girl back. It's the hero's journey with love. So here is uh, Shakuntala looking back to glimpse uh, Dasunyanta, uh, the, uh, the king of this. Uh, this is a painting by Raja Ravi Varma. Now, uh, eventually the power of the Guptas did decline thanks to weaker leaders and attacks from outside powerful kingdoms, the usual stuff. 
Uh, the Gupta Empire eventually was destroyed by a group from Central Asia known as the Huns, uh, who you're going to meet a lot more of in World Studies 2. Um, and eventually India broke up into many kingdoms again. Now, let's look at family and village life in India during this time. And forgive me while I yawn. So, most Indians during this time um, did not live in giant big cities. They, they had Pataliputra and places like that. However, most people lived in small villages in the countryside. Now, the rules that they came up with in their villages had a big impact on the rules that became associated with things like the caste system and uh, the roles of men and women and family responsibilities in India later on. So most village families lived in what is called a joint family, where several generations of families live in one home. And you still do see this in some uh, Indian families up through today. Now, this led to very close family ties, not just with your immediate family, not just your mom and your dad and your brothers and your sisters and your children, but also cousins, aunts, uncles, more distant family as well. Many adult sons actually lived with their parents even after getting married, and they'd sort of bring their family into the family compound instead. Now, Indian families at this time were patriarchal, meaning the men were in charge, sorry, uh, but laws and traditions usually required that the male head of the family did at least have to discuss things with his wife. He wouldn't just be able to fly off the handle and do whatever he felt like doing. So, uh, we still do find that these joint family structures are a part of Indian uh, culture up through today. Now, since dharma, or duty, your responsibilities to your caste, was really big deal, uh, it was the job of your family to educate you in your dharma to make sure that you're doing it well. Uh, so children worked in the fields with their families. They learned the trades of the if their families were merchants. Uh, boys and girls learned the duties of their genders at a very young age, including the idea that you're supposed to uh, marry certain people and act a certain way once you got married. They also learned how to do religious rituals like pujas. Now, parents had the duty of arranging marriages for their kids, and they're meant to be good marriages, uh, oftentimes within their castes, in fact, almost always within their castes. Uh, you, if you were a kshatriya, you were going to marry another kshatriya. That's just the way that goes. Uh, and these are not marriages for love, although hopefully love springs out of it. But, you know, in general, uh, you are marrying somebody almost based on like a deal. Uh, and in northern India, the bride's family actually paid a dowry to the groom's family, um, meaning that they financed the cost of the wedding. Um, having a sister who just got married, I know for a fact that the bride's family still um, is meant to sort of pay for the husband's wedding. So we still see that dowries, they've kind of fallen out of style, but in some places they still do exist. Now, daughters also left their home after marriage, and they moved in with their husband's family. So, like I said about the big family compounds, uh, the wives would move into the husband's family in this situation. Here is... Uh, a modern style, uh, Indian style wedding ceremony today. Uh, weddings are still very big and spectacular in Indian culture. It's kind of, we'll, we'll watch a video on that. So, um, we also see the role of women change over time. So attitudes towards women did change. Uh, early women had a very high status, uh, especially compared to women of later times. Uh, women were thought to have an inborn creative energy that men didn't have, known as a shakti. And shakti uh, were thought to make her husband more complete after marriage. So the woman's shakti completed the man, uh, gave him something that he did not initially have. Um, however, it could also be destructive to both the family and the man if the man did not direct the woman's shakti appropriately. Now, by the end of the Gupta Empire, women were also more and more restricted. We see that upper-class women uh, were expected to cover their bodies from head to toe almost uh, whenever they left the home. Also, lower-class women were expected to still work in the fields and uh, work in the weaving room. Perhaps they, they had a bit more freedom to dress how they wanted just simply because they had to work out where it was blindingly hot. 
Now, the size of the villages also could be anywhere from a few families, so like maybe a couple dozen people, up to several hundred people. This is in the smaller villages. However, generally they worked in small earthen or stone houses uh, surrounded by the fields where their crops were. And farming was dependent upon what we talked about at the beginning of this section, which was monsoons. Now, these villages often made most of their food and goods that they needed uh, internally, in-house. So basically, these were sort of self-sustaining villages. Uh, but occasionally, they would trade for luxury items like spices. They would trade outside the small village. Now, trade and weddings also allow these villages to interact with each other. So you might get married to a girl from the village next to yours. So it was not completely internal. And of course, like we talked about, this helps to spread ideas as well. Now, as these villages mainly could take care of themselves, they often handled their own government as well. Uh, usually the head of the village had a village council made up of respected villagers, and they made the decisions and they dealt with outside issues. Now, women used to be allowed into these council groups. However, as the laws became more and more restricted, uh, the women's power was removed. And also villages were uh, run by the caste system. So we still see that your place within this uh, village was very regimented and restricted. Um, the different levels uh, doing their duties to their castes, even within these small villages too. Uh, 